This week on Fashion Real. This is how I started for the king. I started for the king because I didn't find any clothes I want to wear. Do something you believe in yourself. Don't do it because you've seen it on a website because someone else is doing it, someone else is making money off it. It's not about making a living, it's about living with yourself. Invest in yourself, build equity in your own future. You should always think at the end of the day, what did I do today that's going to put me in a better position tomorrow? You deserve nothing. Remember that. Hey guys, welcome to the pilot episode of Fashion Real. Uh, this is a show where I interview creative entrepreneurs within the fashion industry, uh, find out what makes them tick, what their marketing secrets are, how they build their brands, and hopefully distill a load of success secrets which I can pass on to you. Uh, in this first episode, I have a fantastic guest. His name is Emil Vaindotter, and he's the creative director of Pearly King. Now, it's a tailored menswear brand which he set up when he was 18 years old. He's now 25, it's stopped in over 12 countries around the world and he has nearly 500 people working on this brand. Um, some of the advice in this episode is fantastic. He really gets into sort of like motivation, work ethics, how to build your content and uh, find your tribe and build your brand. So I think you'll really get something good out of this. So enjoy. Holy King, very interesting name. Can mm -hmm. you explain the story behind that and where that came from? Well, when uh, I first started the brand, it wasn't actually me, it was pitched to me by a colleague in the office. I didn't really know much about it, but I liked the concept when it was explained to me that the Pearly Kings and Queens were not the most affluent of people in London. And one day in the Thames, um, a shipment of Japanese pearl buttons was kind of washed ashore due to the ship sinking. Right. And then that made them, this is, this is the story I've heard, this is how it's yeah. pitched to me. <laughs> Um, they kind of washed ashore and became available to like the Cockney uh, market salesmen and and they took their old raggy clothes and kind of embellished them. So I like the idea of taking old vintage ideas, well this is how I interpret it anyway, taking old vintage or out of date or timeless pieces and breathing new life into them. Right. It's strictly a concept, it's not... Not a, yeah. It's not a I think manifesto. when I was researching, I saw something about the, uh, when I looked up Pearly King, mm. and you get the, the pictures of like the old bikers and that with then loads yeah. of embellished things yeah, in them it's, as well. Yeah, it's, it's taken a, a lot of things, and like I said, it's not something I wouldn't take in literally, it's more of a, an, an ideal. An idea, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so I was reading in another interview you did um, that you started Pearly King as well as a vessel that you could experiment yourself with different mm. processes. And yeah, finishes. this is the thing because when I started Pearly King, I didn't really fully know what I was doing. It was still uh, an educational platform for me. That's good. Start was, before you're ready. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, uh, you don't learn until you jump in the deep ends, I think. So um, I was still experimenting, I was still learning about this is when kind of denim was really coming into its kind of artisanal phase artisanal phase and um, a lot of people were experimenting with denim and taking it more seriously as a well as a textile as well as kind of a whole lifestyle you know wearing salvage from dry so I was experimenting a lot with different processes I was spending a lot of nights sanding and stuff like that and because I learned to do that myself it kind of branched out into other product groups now we do a lot of unique and kind of out of, we've done a lot of work with chemicals that not a lot of people are doing now. Okay. This is something we're moving away from now as well. Right. Everything so you're has always reinventing yourself. This is the thing, as I grow as a person, I like to think that the brand grows with me. I, I have like little phases of every different thing, so I like to think of it as a house that's just constantly evolving. That's cool. I've read on your website at the moment, is um, each of your pieces of denim, it's got like your signature emblem built into the pocket, but it's underneath, so yeah, it only this, shows with this, when this it is fades. The thing. I remember when I first came up with that, it was very hard to initially develop. I've seen it copied a few times now, which is a bit heartbreaking by companies that obviously will take credit, and I can't really do much about that. But yeah, it is something that came from these experimental phases of working with denim. I wanted something that would wear in as you I didn't want anything so contrived like a big stitch on the back. Yeah. I didn't want anything, you know, to be the first thing you saw. I want you to see the gene before you saw the branding. Yeah. But the branding still has to be there. It's still a, a commercial business, isn't it? But what I liked about that was the way that it shows over time. So it's yeah. it's like puts more emphasis on the fact that this isn't throwaway fashion. You're not going to be wearing mm. it for a couple of months and then going on to the next thing. It's kind of like a sort of a timeless piece. This is the thing. I wanted something, like I said, that showcased the fabric more than just our branding. I didn't want a stitch, I wanted something different. I wanted something that showed we used a decent fabric. We did use, 
because the, the, the price point of Pillar King isn't high. So what we're trying to obviously do is show that we're putting in the effort because people are naturally suspicious yeah. of getting good value on things, yeah. which is uh, too, it sounds too good to be true. It usually is. But because we make our own jeans and we don't add a huge margin, we'd like to put a lot of effort into the clothes and not overcharge people. But then we find ourselves trying to tell people, look, you are actually getting a good deal here. You are actually getting a, a 250 pound jean yeah. for half that. Yeah, so those like, little embellishments. Yeah, that's what we try and do, and we hope our customer notices that. Right, I'm a big believer these days that brands need to take a step back from fast fashion, uh, find their own niches instead of chasing the mass market, which is something that you seem to have done spectacularly well. Uh, can you describe the Pearly King man to me in detail? This is the thing, when I first started Pearly King, everybody wanted to know who I saw my customer as. But the thing is, when you... Uh, when you go out and explore and actually meet customers, you meet them, you get taken around by your distributors, you get to meet all your different customers, you meet their customers, you realize that it's not really somebody you can chase, it's not that, you know, you know the demographic that everybody's looking at is, you know, 18 to 35, male, likes this kind of music, it's not about that. I think if you do a brand correctly, they'll recognize something, they'll recognize a brand value and aesthetic that everybody kind of subscribes to. And I see guys who mix it with Zara pieces, I see things like high-end mixes. I think it's more about you sticking to yourself as a brand. You do what you believe in yourself. And some people will kind of twig onto it and see what you're doing and stay loyal to it. Right. If you go chasing one sort of person, you're going to kind of compromise your vision. So do you think it's more trying to appeal to a certain ideology rather than a demographic? I think people are... The way that fast fashion has gone, I think it's created a lot of cynicism in the customer. And I think if you can create a brand that has a genuine code of, not ethics, but like kind of a brand guideline that seems genuine, that seems organic, that's not just cooked up from market research and trying to chase a certain trend. I mean, if you see a lot of the, the high street, they're just trying to cotton on to the latest trend. Yeah. And it feels so fake. It feels like somebody's it just. Yeah, it's just it's awkward, is what it is. And I think if you have something that you believe in and produce because you want it to be that way yourself. Yeah. If you create a brand because you want to wear that, you saw something that you weren't find. This is how I started Pillar King. I started Pillar King because I didn't find any clothes I wanted to wear. I couldn't. I didn't see anything that was unusual I saw everybody just chasing each other's tails yeah. and I think if you create something that you want yourself I think there's like-minded people out there yeah so now depending on how well you do it there'll be more or less people yeah but I say it's always better to shout to a few than murmur to a, a mass audience so you kind of started it from a, a point to scratch your own itch so to speak exactly I, d I didn't want to think about I'm doing it for this person I'm doing it for myself if other people kind of like it and then, then we can probably carry on because there are a lot of brands out there that aren't really businesses, they're more like hobbies. Yeah. And as much as I respect that, you have to kind of keep it commercial. You have to sometimes add pieces, not water down your collection, but you have to sometimes, like mm -hmm. I say, travel and meet people and kind of see their perspective of your brand. Yeah. But at the same time, if you're not doing it for yourself, there's no point in carrying on because people will see through what you're trying to put out there. And it'll just look fake. It will look fake, yeah. it will look awkward. That actually brings me on to the next question. Um, you told me um, once about you're not a fan of all these trend forecasting services and you ban all your designers from using them. Um, well, I try to, but they sneak, try on. To. <laughs> they sneak on there anyway. That's the... So what are your thoughts behind that? Well, like I said, when you're ex exhibiting and you have you know people from the various uh, trend uh, forecasting agencies, I won't name any names, but they're all, they come on and they ask if we can uh, take pictures, and I, I don't know who's saying yes to that. I mean, we're a little company. I mean, uh, we've come a long way, but we're still fighting these guys, and I've had, you know, things copied by the bigger people and stuff like that. I mean, it's weird because a lot of, especially in the UK, the independents aren't supported. Right. On the media, especially, you can always see how to get the look for less. Yeah, you can. And I, I don't, I don't see how that's valuable to anybody. Yeah, I think all that, the morning talk shows and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's a false economy because that's where the economy of growth is going to come from. It's not going to come from the, the top high street because they're killing trends off before they even happen. Yeah. This is the thing. I don't follow the trend forecast. I don't really follow the short trends because by the time my collection comes out next year, 
that's already over. It's going to feel old hat. So I'd rather start my own thing. Whether it becomes a trend or not, I'm not really interested because I'm doing this for myself. Personally, I feel a lot of the trends seem to be manufactured by the high streets themselves, and it's like... It's become a weird thing. It used to be that they drop from the top down. Yeah. Now it's coming up from street style. Everybody's watching each other. So it's starting to... It's, it's a strange thing. It's becoming like an arms race of who can create and kill a trend quicker. So I'd rather just sidestep all that and do something I believe in, something I like. Obviously we look at the trends like the silhouettes and lapel size because that's what you do to keep relevant. We're not going to start, you know, when there's a slim jean, we're not going to start doing flares just to be niche. You have to still keep within the realms of commerciality, but do something you believe in yourself. Don't do it because you've seen it on a website because someone else is doing it, someone else is making money off it. Yeah, at the end it's not about making a living, it's about living with yourself. Yeah, I think that ties in nicely. You said to me... Um you believe fashion shouldn't be a democracy? No, absolutely not. This is the thing. I think it has, and I've recently been reading a lot about haute couture and stuff like that, and when people stopped listening to designers and started taking it in a more democratic way, we've not really lost, we've, we've gained individuality and that's fantastic, but we've lost quality. Now because people are feeling that they own fashion in their own way, things are getting made more sloppily, people that are not caring about the process behind it. I mean, that makes me sound like some sort of awful Kaiser dictator. No, uh, no, I, I do get that. I watched the documentary recently on Hulk Joe myself as well, yeah. and it's like, is it needless extravagance, or is there an actual niece, is there a craftsmanship, is there an artistic That's exactly value what I mean. The, the thing is, you, fashion has always been an advisory basis, and a, a, you're buying somebody's ideal of fashion, you're buying someone else's taste really. Right. You're saying, I like this aesthetic, I'm going to align myself with that. Yeah. Now when you've got factories that really don't have designers, that have creative directors, they're just churning things out, I don't think that's for the better. Right, so as a fashion brand, um, so when I, when I feel affinity to a fashion brand, I'm yeah. subscribing to their taste yeah. and letting them tell me what looks good. Not really, I think you're kind of aligning, it's a vessel for you. It's like, this is a like-minded person, they subscribe to my kind of aesthetic, they like the same architecture, same kind of minimalistic look or something like that. Whatever you take as your personal aesthetic, it's nice to know someone out there shares that. Right. And then that's the way you want to represent yourself out to the world. It's about finding someone else who can align themselves. Right. That's it's, interesting. This is, a brand is more or less saying, here is my mast, I'm putting my flag on it. Yeah. So, moving on to the marketing of Furley Brand yeah, yeah. and the visual side, um, on all the photo shoots you've always been very hands on, you've art directed them rather than outsourcing it to other yeah. creatives to do for you. Yeah. Um, but recently, um, since disagreeing with a photographer on yeah. set, you've actually uh, picked up a camera and started shooting a lot yourself yeah. and you've since set up Feral Studios as both a creative agency and a collaborative space for other creatives. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey and how you've gone from just uh, you know just being the creative director of a fashion brand to being more involved in marketing as a whole? Well, for me, I was very disappointed whenever you put so much effort into a in a collection to have your vision not really because for me, images for the lookbook for the campaign that's where you really put your vision out to your customer. It needs to kind of convey everything that you've put into the collection, all your little subtle references, your ideals, what you really want to convey. And there's not a lot of photographers that are able to do that. So I was so disappointed that I thought, I'm gonna to have to take training and take this on myself. Then I really started, I fell in love with photography. I really wanted to kind of take it further because when you work for your own brand, you have an aesthetic that was your own when you started the brand, but you want to branch out and do other things as well. You really want to kind of explore other avenues of your creativity. Yeah. So I started um, Feral Studios with my now business partner Paul. He worked with me, or currently works on with me on Pearly King as well. So together we want to do branding, we want to explore all the avenues that are available to us because if you are creative I think you have to kind of embrace you can't just Well you can't just pick and choose from the buffet, you need the whole course I think. Yeah. I so suppose with uh, with Pearly King, you're restricted to that one aesthetic. Yeah, it's it's one brief uh, you have to keep to that style. But I have so many other interests and so, so many other kind of aesthetics that I want to explore, which I really feel I can do through my photography. Speaking of content, um, as well as the images, what else do you think fashion brands should be concentrating on these days? Well, everything is video now. 
I mean, the way that Google kind of rates and Facebook as well with their ads, video is just more viable. That's where they're really making that push. I think you have an opportunity with video that you don't have with stills. You can convey more than just a visual aesthetic. You can kind of tell a story. Again, you can do that through stills, but you can add music. You have just more at hand. It can be more visually stimulating through music and video than you can with just stills alone. Okay. So I think that's where people should... Add. I think I always supplement it with stills because that's a quicker way to get your message across than a video. But I think video is very important. I like to see now more literature coming from brands. Like a, the blogging side has become like a huge powerhouse for e-commerce especially. But what you show on your blog, like various tutorials, I really like those. A lot of websites do a lot of good stuff like that. Educating the customer, not just on the products they sell, but just what parts of their aesthetic as a brand. Mr. Yeah. Paul does it very well. You know, They'll just not try and sell you something. They'll offer information for free. Right. And I think it's... Think more like a publisher instead of a salesman. A publisher, exactly. That's very well put. Yeah, I think that's exactly how it is. Offer something for free, and I think people will come to you. Okay. And make sure that what quality is the highest thing. Yeah. Curation is the one of the key words that we like to use here. Don't put anything out. That's crap. There's no point. Time for the quick fire question round. Oh dear. Um, Right, first off, what is your morning routine? How do you set yourself up for a successful day? I'm always late to work. <laughs> so a good start. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I'm, it doesn't matter if I get up at 6 or 8. I'm always at work at 10. I live five minutes away. But I really try and have to slow my day down to try and become a neutral, well-balanced person. You have to kind of clear your head before you go in and coffee. Do you have any particular routines you do in the morning to help clear your head? I just sit and watch TV for a while. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. And coffee. And coffee. Yeah. It's all about the coffee. Yeah, it's all about the coffee. <laughs> um, following on from that, um, what are the first three things you like to tackle when you get into the office? The first problem is usually the emails. Now it's really easy to procrastinate on those, and I'm the first to do it. But with the time difference being a lot of our customers and a lot of our suppliers are overseas, you have to kind of get that done first thing in the morning, otherwise you've wasted the day. Right. So that's one thing you have to do. Then you're going to have various staff coming with problems. So you have to sort those out. And then third is getting on with your day. Getting on with your day. Go into those emails, so you kind of try and you batch all that, so you've got it first thing, get it out of the way as much as you can. Well, like I said, I'm terrible for procrastination. If I didn't have a staff around me, I'm not the most disciplined person. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of flighty that way as a creative. So I need a structure around me to kind of make sure I so get things sure. done. If I need people around me to be asking questions all the time. Perfect, perfect. Um, OK, so yeah, quite fittingly, following on from that, what tools do you use to stay productive and to keep yourself organized? Well, it's going to come back to coffee again. I used to take a lot of notes and like write down to-do lists, but I think you spend more time in admin than, than actually getting it done. I think uh, the best thing you can do when you get into the office is just go into your staff and go, right, what's the problem today? What are we dealing with? And then you know yourself what you have to get on with. So it's just taking the bull by the horns and getting it done rather than dancing around the issue all the time. Perfect, perfect. Okay, what is your biggest frustration right now and how do you plan to overcome it? Uh, my biggest problem now is we're putting a lot of effort into, like we discussed, content, making sure that we're projecting a high-end brand image, something that's in line with our kind of values here as a brand. It's hard to monetize that. It's, kind of, it's hard to kind of get your customer to increase their budget just because you're putting more production value into your branding yeah. and your marketing. It's something that is accumulative and it takes time, but it's frustrating when you're putting all this effort in and you don't see your kind of efforts paid off right away. It's not an immediate benefit. Yeah, so it's about an accumulative effort and I'm hoping that it will end up in monetary benefits in the end. Perfect. Um, okay, if you weren't in the fashion industry then, what would you be doing with your life? Well, obviously I do the photography now, but I can can that because I would never do anything other than fashion photography. Yeah. But other than that, I'd like to be a restaurateur, I think. Oh, right. Because it's quite similar to the whole idea of branding. And it's something people subscribe to. I mean, it's food is one thing. I always like to cook and stuff like that. But I like the thing that goes around creating a brand within a restaurant. What are your favourite restaurants? Where do you like to eat? Well, just because I work in, Farish, uh, in fashion, it'll be La Vigne in Paris. Right. So that's just because it's opposite uh, Dior's office and uh, there's a lot of fashion around there. Okay. I wish I could say I'm familiar with that one, but... <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> um, give me three items on your bucket list. 
three items on the bucket list. Well, as odd as it is, I'd like to serve time in the army. Right, okay. Yeah, I'd like to climb a mountain, and I'd like to do a road trip across the southern states of America in an old muscle car. I like that one. Yeah. And, um, oh, what's the film? Vanishing Point. I've not seen that one, but you know the sad thing is it comes from the Top Gear episode that just looks like a lot of fun. Right. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah definitely worth checking out. Yeah, film. definitely. Like, uh, I'll have to look at The whole film's just one char- car yeah. chasing some Dodge Challenger down the is it Route 66. Well, I thought you were going to say Thelma and Louise then, but I thought I definitely can't admit to having seen that. It's Thelma and Louise, yeah. yeah that's yeah. good as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, if you could talk to your 20 year old self, what would you tell them? I mean, it wouldn't really matter. Me at 20 years old wouldn't listen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's hard to give anybody advice, especially I think when you, the further you go along in the fashion industry, you realize the more time you spend at it, the less you actually do know. Right. So I, I don't feel like I'm in any position to give anybody any advice, but it would be to slow down, I think. To slow down. To slow down. That's good advice, very yeah. good advice. Um, so what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given yourself? Like I said, at 25 I still wouldn't listen anyway, so I don't really... <laughs> so you don't take advice? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, one thing I, I don't know, I've, I've heard uh, going around, I think it's, you deserve nothing, remember that. It's that don't think you should have something handed to you. Don't think because you've worked hard that all of a sudden that it should pay off. Because the thing is, when fashion, you'll work hard all season, and then there's like a small gap between when you finish one collection, you've done all your things, you've finished the images, you've finished that, everybody has their collections, and it's time to start again. People take a holiday between there. And that's where I think the difference is between somebody who's good and somebody who's great. So instead of like taking Christmas off or taking a summer holiday, it's time to kind of get in-house and buffer everything up so it's ready for next season and you're in a better position. Work on your run rather than in it. And another thing is you should always think at the end of the day, what did I do today? that's going to put me in a better position tomorrow. That's, uh, that's very good. That's a good actionable step that anyone can do. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing I gave myself as a bit of advice, but it's following it, it's another How thing. How do you do that? Do you just do it as a mental thought, or do you have a, like a evening journal or something? No, uh, the thing is, I, it's easy to forget your own advice, especially, because in a small team you spend most of your time firefighting. Yep. But you have to do one thing a day that I think we'll go, I'm better off tomorrow because I did that today. Right, perfect. And um, if you were starting Pearly King all over again, what would you do differently? I'd take my time over it a lot more. I think um, when you, like I said, when I was 18, I was just so eager to get started and just hit the ground running that you don't put everything in a, in a line properly, you don't think it through. So you start and then three, days, you, uh, three years later, you're still correcting the mistakes that you could have done three months before you even started. Right. So it's thinking it through, coming up with a good business plan. So again, it comes slow down. Yeah, That's slow down. Okay, uh, so imagine you are a new fashion brand and you're just starting out, you've only got a thousand pounds to spend on your marketing. Mm-hmm. How would you spend it? I've always said, I would always put it on images. Good images spread themselves. Poor images, well, I don't know how many good images you can get for a thousand pounds, but I'd, I'd put the effort in doing it yourself. You should always invest in yourself. Yeah. If you need to learn something, or if you need somebody in your team to learn something, it's better to learn it yourself. Yeah. Invest in yourself, build equity in your own future. Yeah. Because, um, but like I said, marketing, a thousand pounds, I would put it on images. Because a good quality image will spread itself, whereas other ones you have to kind of supplement with paid pushing. Yeah, perfect. So create content, not advertising. Exactly. Yeah. So, where are you headed next, Emil? What's your ambition for Pearly King and yourself in general? The problem we have now with Pearly King, we've hit kind of a, a glass ceiling. Where we're in the best stores, we're in the front of the shop, they're buying a lot, we're in a lot of countries. It's taking it to the next step where you become a powerhouse, where you become a real brand. This is what we're trying to do with our, what I don't want to say marketing, I want to say content. We want to put out an image there that makes us not just a brand, but a house. Yeah. Something that we stand for, creating something that aligns with our brand and makes people kind of realize that we're more than just a collection. I think that's how we'll get through that ceiling and take to our next phase, a Pearly King 2.0, if you will. 2.0, I like that. Um, If you could ask anything of our audience then, what would it be? It'd be to buy a Pearly King so we can get through that ceiling. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Do you want to share your websites, Twitters, that sort of thing? It's uh, www.pearly-king.com. 
and we don't really like Twitter. Do you know what? I've never oh, liked Twitter. Go on, man. Yeah, I'm going to go on a rant about Twitter. I think it's, um, I don't know, I think it's ugly. I, I'm not the only person in fashion to have said that, I think. Right. I think there was, I think it was Vogue who said they didn't like Twitter. I know that makes me terribly archaic to say so, but <laughs> I do like Instagram, though. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I think as a visual person, you're never going to like Twitter. Yeah. I do like the fact that they've started with the animated GIFs now, animated JPEGs and stuff. So oh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> the feed's a little bit more visual. I think they must have taken on a lot of that feedback. I don't know. I think Twitter, for me, this is a personal thing. It's not really a view of Pearly King as a, as a brand, I'd yeah. say. Um, it's kind of a sort of box to stand on to spew nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's not... I don't think it contributes much. Mm. It's just scandal, really. At least with Instagram, you get a visual stimulation from it. Okay. So what's your Instagram handle? <laughs> At Pearly King Jeans. At Pearly King Jeans. Yeah. So everyone can follow you on there. Yeah. That's great. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. So that was the first episode of Fashion Real. Um, if you like that and you like the format, then please uh, show your support for the channel and subscribe at the bottom. Uh, this will help me make more of these and get some awesome guests for future content. See you soon.